We all agree that he is king. But how do you worship a king? When I was a kid, I experienced Christianity from the time I was born till my entire life. I've known I've shared some of these stories with you guys, but some I'll never forget. Being in certain church services, experiences where God took over. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Raise your hand. You say, Pastor Johnny, I've been in a service where God took over. And it was no longer about us. It was no longer about the people on the stage. It was no longer about the people with microphones or in the back or titles or positions. Tears took over and brokenness became and conviction swept the place. I don't, I don't know how you would label it. And I, I know there's different terms that we use an outpouring of God or a movement of the Spirit of God, a revival or an anointing. A touch of God, the presence of God, I, I, there's so many terms, and the Bible uses all of those. I hope none of that makes you nervous, because that's all Bible. Then I've seen people try to replicate it and duplicate it. I remember hearing stories about the revivals that happened under tents, and they would throw down sawdust, and then years later you find people trying to get tents and throw down sawdust to try to replicate what was there before. I'm not against a tent or anything else. But the power was never in the tent, and the power was never in the sawdust. Sometimes we don't understand the power behind it, so we try to replicate the results of it, or the application, or the technique of it. The moving of God can't be created, can't be copied, can't be built up by an instrument, it can't be replicated by a worship team or a worship band. I believe we've gone through somewhat of a spiritual drought when it comes to this. I mean, it's been a long time since we had to throw out the order of service because the Holy Spirit stepped in and he said, you need to sit down and let me take the reins of this. To our kids, it becomes a theory. It's an idea. It's, it's something we talk about. It's, we, sh- we show clips dating back to D.L. Moody and Billy Sunday and, and even... Uh, the, 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 the revivals that broke out in, in, in the early years of our church and things like that. And I ask the question, why? And I believe that there's a number of reasons that we could lay it out as to why. A, a lack of righteousness. God will not put his blessing or, or pour out his power or his blessing in the movement of the Spirit of God. If we're quenching the Spirit of God, it can't work that way. And sin quenches the Spirit of God. I know it probably wasn't fun. For four weeks, I just talked about dangers in the darkness and how we've allowed some sins and some things to control us and creep into the church. And I believe that is true. I believe another thing is apathy. We just don't care. We don't want it. We don't crave. We don't ask. We don't seek. We don't, we don't praise. Another thing, we're, we're, not, we're not asking God. We, we, we don't have it in our hearts to even ask for it. But another aspect that I know is true is a lack of true worship. And I know when I say the word worship, our minds go in a thousand different directions. And I'm going to do a doctrinal study and then literally do this message in two parts. Actually, if you have your Bibles, turn to two of the passages that we'll be dwelling on mostly. But at the beginning, I'll be pulling up a number of passages and verses in in Luke chapter 7 and in Revelation chapter 5. And these are two passages that we're going to go, and next week we'll finish the end of this, uh, this message as we get into the finish up Luke chapter 7. While you're turning there in Psalm 22, verse 3, but thou art holy, understanding that God is a holy, righteous God. That's what we talk about, that God cannot step into unrighteousness or dwell or do his work in unrighteousness, recognizing that thou art holy. And thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. You want to know where God dwells or where God works or where God moves is in the praise and the worship of his people. That word inhabit means to sit down. It means to dwell or remain. It means to abide or continue. It sets the stage. It's, it, it sets the atmosphere. It's a place of fellowship with God or a place of communion with God. I want to experience the presence and the power of God. And I think we all would say that we want that. But let me tell you, there's a big difference between a song service and a worship service. 
There's a big difference. And it's not something that I don't care how much you practice or plan that you can, you can create a worship service because it starts in the heart. See, a church service and a revival is different. We're talking about the difference of fire and passion and life change and conviction and prayer. When God takes over and God begins to break down walls and God begins to go beyond ourselves and beyond human in the Old Testament, we have a symbol of this, and I'm planning on pulling this into this series, where everywhere that they went, the, the, the presence of God was represented by the Ark of the Covenant, and they would take the Ark of the Covenant and put it in the Holy of Holies. And they would go in there to worship God, and it was very separated from everybody else, but when they were traveling, they would take the Ark of the Covenant, and that would lead them. And where the Ark of the Covenant went represented the priest, and the priest would carry it, represented the worshipers. And where the worshipers were, there was power in the, the blessings and the movement of God where they were at. The Ark of the Covenant went before the people as they traveled, and God showed up and gave them victory. Now, I'm going to ask you the question, what is true worship? And I throw the word true in there because of the idea is if we went around and asked the question, what is worship? Man, we all have ideas. We, we all have opinions. I, I'm going to give you guys some background to this and tr- just try to fill in the blanks before we get to Revelation. Answering the question, what is true worship? That The Christmas story is all about worship. If we were to say, why are we doing this now? Because the Christmas story was all about worship. When the first announcement was made, the Bible says, and suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God. From the very mention of the Savior was the heavenly host praising God and saying glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill towards men. One thing that I want you to notice as we do all this is we talk about praise and worship and a lot of times we're not even bringing in singing. And a lot of times we sit there and talk everything about worship And praise is all about singing. And I'm not saying that that's not part of it. The Bible is saturated with illustrations that it is. But the shepherds went to be in the presence of God. They came to worship him and they left praising him. The next part of the story we read about the wise men. Now when the king, now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east of Jerusalem saying, where is he that is born king of the Jews? They recognize him for who he was. We'll get into that as we go through this as well. Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star and we have come. We have, we have walked all this way for one reason, to worship him. And the wise men walked into the presence of God. They bowed down before him. They gave gifts and they worshiped him. We get to the book of Revelation. Actually, you should have your Bibles open to that. Look at, with, we, before we get into chapter 5, look at verse 4. And I'm trying to lay it out. It's, it's all through the Bible, but we're laying, we're trying to define worship. What does the Bible define as worship? we got to stay there. We talk about what we do as an expression of worship, and we don't understand where the foundation of worship, but then we've lost it all together. And the Bible says in the four and twenty elders, in verse 10, the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne. They recognize him once again as king, and they responded to him as king. And worship him that liveth forever and ever, and they cast their crowns before the throne, saying, what were they doing? Worshiping God, bowing down in respect. Now at this point right here, there's no singing once again. See, worship is so misunderstood. We talk about worship all the time. We have worship time, worship service, worship choir, worship band, worship team, worship music. But see, worship is not something you switch on. And I know we sit there and say sometimes in there, and I, I, I know there's nothing wrong with saying this. Let's stand and worship because we want to engage in it. But if your worship didn't start when you woke up, then you're not really going to have worship today. I'll explain what that means as we get in this. It's not an event, it's not a style. It's not how high you raise your hands or how many songs you sing in a row or how many times you repeat the chorus. It's not a hymn, and it's not modern worship song either. So what is it? What is true worship? Number one, worship is placing great value and attention on something that is deserving. Worship is placing great value or attention on something that is deserving. 
See, worship can be challenging to explain because it is both an attitude and an action. And I think sometimes when we leave out the attitude and we go straight to the action, we leave out the motive behind the action. So let's start with the attitude or the mindset of it. If you were to look up worship in Webster's Dictionary, you're going to find the common term which means worship. Something that is worthy or worth the worship or worthy of the attention or worthy of the value that you're placing upon it. It means something of great value. Something deserving of the time or the attention. Now to put this in a term that we would understand, how many of you, no judgment here, how many of you guys got up and went out Black Friday? Let's see all our Black Friday shoppers right here. Okay, I did not. I'll be honest. I've done it in the past. I remember trying to save like 10, 15 bucks on on a game for the boys and I stood outside of GameWorks and I remember getting in this giant line and I remember freezing my tail off. I was so cold out there, and I got up to the door, walked inside, and the dude said, hey, we just sold the last one, you get nothing. (laughs) Went to the next door, same thing, over and over again. The next year, I got up, and he said, I'm not going out. It is not worth it. It's not worthy of my attention. It is not worth the effort. It is not worth getting up early. It's not worth the sacrifice of my sleep. It is not worth it. You say, some of you got up and you said, there was something that I went after that was worth the effort, worth the time. See, if you're here today, you came to church because it was worth your time. It was worth getting up on a day that you did not have to go to work. It was worth getting up and getting out of the house. See, worship describes the value of something. From the very first time, and and I, I looked up, where is worship first mentioned in the Bible? It was actually when Abraham was bringing Isaac up to be sacrificed. And that's a whole other story. But Abraham said to his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I, will, and, I and the lad will go yonder and worship. It was the very first form of worship or, worship, or the first time that word was used. He was on his way to sacrifice his child, which we all know that God did not take that sacrifice. It was a test to see how much he valued God. But in a sense, he was standing before God saying, there is nothing that I would not give. There is no, no, uh, there, no limit to the value that I would put on my God. He's worthy of everything. It was Abraham's heart that was displaying that God was worthy of the sacrifice. Now, Revelation chapter 5, verse 1, we see the same principle again. And I saw in the right hand of him, that sat on the throne written within the backside, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof. And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither uh, to look thereon. And I wept much because no man was found worthy to open to read the book, neither to look thereon. Now, Now think about the idea of weeping. It was a matter of defeat. It was a matter, and this is, this is this dramatic depiction, this dramatic display of, a, of emotions that are going on here, saying, man, who is worthy? And one of the elders said unto me, weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed. And all of a sudden, watch what begins to happen. All of their mindset, all of their attention, their, their view of God, their view of the situation began to change hath prevailed to open the book and to lose the seven seals thereof. All of a sudden, it's you don't have to be defeated. You don't have to weep. Change your perspective. When their mindset change, their actions change. Now we have to get this. If your mind is not aligned on the king, your actions will not be correct. It won't. It doesn't matter how much you do this or how loud you sing or how loud you don't sing or how much you complain or not complain. If your heart is not right, what comes out of your mouth will not be right. In verse 9, they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals. Do you know why? This is why they deemed him as worthy. Do you know why they deemed him as worthy? For thou wast slain and has redeemed us by God by the blood. They recognized him as the Savior. They recognized Jesus as the Savior. Out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, 
and has made us unto our God kings and priests. And two weeks from now, I'm planning on getting into that. And we shall reign on earth. And I beheld and heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beasts and the elders. The number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. Won't that be a sight? Yes. Saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive worship. Say, what do you mean? No, to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. He is worthy of everything that I have and all that I have I place on the one that is worthy of it. He deserves our power. He deserves our praise. He deserves our sacrifice. He deserves our blessings. Verse 13, in every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under earth and such as are in the seas and all of them Heard I saying, bless and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth on the throne, the king. Unto the lamb forever and the four beasts, amen, and the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. Worshipped. They placed their love, their focus, their praise, their attention on the one that was deserving of it. Worship begins with the mindset of the worth of something. Matthew 2.2 has one of the definitions of worship that we use. Saying, where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and we have come to worship. There's a few meanings that come along with it. It's not just worship, the mindset of it. But the, 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 the wise men travel two years to be in the presence of a small child. And you say, why? Because they deemed him as worthy of doing this. Now listen to this definition of worthy, the Greek word for, uh, for worship in Matthew 2.2. 2. It means to kiss like a dog licking his master's hand, to fawn or crouch, to bow oneself, to adore, to reverence. Worship, number two, is the act or demonstration of surrender or respect. Say, so wait a minute, Pastor Tony, none of this sounds like what we talk about all the time. You're right, we miss this part. We wonder why God's not inhabiting the praise of his people, why God is not showing up, why revival is not breaking out, because a lot of times we make what we do about us and rather than about him. You know what's scary about that? When I come in here and I don't like this song and I'm not singing, I'm not standing, I'm not clapping, I'm not moving, I'm not, I'm, I, 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 we made it, we're, we're the idols. We talk about a worship service and when the attention of everything that comes out of your mouth is starts with the word I, we have become the focus of our worship. Yeah. It's me. What I want. And I can tell you it can happen on any level in any church of anything. It's an attitude issue, not a response. It's not the method or the style. It's the attitude, the mindset of why did you come? Why did you wake up? And who are you thinking about? See, worship is the act or demonstration of surrender and respect. See, in the Old Testament, we see this throughout the Bible, and I don't think we've always understood. There's things that we do even when we say, let's bow our heads and pray. Why do we bow our heads and pray? Is that just something we do out of tradition, like folding of the hands and closing of our eyes? Is there a reason that we do that? You see, the Bible says in Genesis, going back in the history of this, and the man bowed his head and worshiped the Lord. The, the word worship in the Hebrew in this passage means to depress or, or, or to bow down, to crouch, to fall, to humbly, humbly lower oneself. To go before God and say, it's not about me, so I lay myself under your authority. I, I put myself beneath you, not above you. It's not about me. It's all about you. See, we, all, we, we struggle with this concept because this is not part of our culture. We don't have a king. If I was to meet the president, I would probably shake his hand rather than bow before him. But in other cultures and Bible times, their culture of respect and anybody of authority or, or position, they would bow before them. It was part of their, 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 their culture of doing this. In other cultures, they would do this as well, and even in today. But we don't traditionally do this. We do this when we pray, but we probably don't even know why. We say, bow your heads and pray. The man bowed down his head, the verse says. 
Both the Hebrew and the Greek words for worship both have the core meaning of to bow down in respect. Let me tell you what it does not mean. The word worship does not mean clap, stand, shout, sing, dance, or raise your hands. And say, Pastor Tony, are you against those things? No, the Bible <laughs> it has all that in there. I'm not, I'm not belittling that. I'm not cutting that out of there. I just think a lot of times we get into the emotionalism and we forget the heart of it to begin with. It, 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 we, we lose the mindset. We walk into the traditions that we do and the worship and the atmosphere and the feeling and how it makes me feel and if it made me feel good rather than why did I do it in the first place? See, at the core of worship, it means to bow. Worship means to bow because where worship means to come humbly before the Lord and respect him for who he is. That he is worthy of what I'm going to give him. He's worthy of my respect. He is worthy of my attention. It's complete submission to God. All that I am and all that I have belongs to God. He said, I don't think I'm there yet. Then we cannot truly experience worship without first being here. Bowing demonstrates honor and respect to the authority of the kingship that he holds. It is a physical expression used in the Old Testament. It is a physical expression that will also be in heaven. Let me explain this. When we go back to Revelation chapter 4, and the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne. See, when they walked into the presence of the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the natural reaction is to humble yourself before him. Literally, to recognize him as the king. And then the Bible says, and worship him that liveth forever and ever. And they cast, they took all that I have, all that I've done, all that I've worked for, all that I've served in the church in my life, and I lay it at his feet. You know why? Because all that I did, I did for him. It wasn't about me. Thou art worthy. You are are deserving, you are the one. O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things. You know why? For thy pleasure they are and were created. In heaven, we will bow and worship because bowing is the opposite of who we are. It's the opposite of pride. See, the Bible even says that God will break the pride of every man in Philippians 2.10, that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. You know, it's not worship at all in that thing. They're not sitting there worshiping God. They're submitting to the authority of who he is. You sit there and say, man, I, I'm an atheist. I don't believe in God. I promise you there will be no atheist standing before the throne of God on that day. They will all recognize him who, for who he is and what he's done and the fact that he is the king of things in heaven and things of earth and the things under the earth. It's what I'm saying. Without surrender, there is no worship. You know how we sit there and hold back from God and we sit there and say, I want, I want the outpouring of the Spirit of God and I want revival and I want God to touch. And then we sit there and we hold back and we preached on this a few weeks ago. If you guys remember all the apple illustration of what it means to give and it shall be given unto you. Without sacrifice, without surrender, without humility, there is no true worship. All you have is a song service, instruments, and people with microphones. It's no different than karaoke night. We leave out the purpose of which we're doing, the one that we're worshiping in the first place. See, God in the Old Testament, he had a name for this that we read all the time, and I don't think we've acknowledged the name for this. See, in the Old Testament, the Bible talked about unto a land flowing with milk and honey, for I will not go up in the midst of thee, for thou art a stiff-necked people. Have you ever wondered when the Bible talks about they're stiff-necked, and the Bible uses that term a lot, they're stiff-necked. Have you ever stopped to think, what does that mean, that they are stiff-necked? means that they refuse to bend the muscles in their neck to bow before God. 
You think about how often the Bible talks about when God rejected there and they were defeated and they were not inhabiting the praise of God. They were not bringing in the worship of God. They were not bringing in the humility that they should be having and they made it all about them. God called them stiff-necked. Literally meaning God said, I am not stepping into that when my people refuse to recognize me as the king of kings. Even the demons got it. In Mark 5 with the uh, maniac of Gadara and, and always day and night he was in the mountains and in the tombs crying and cutting himself with stones. But when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him. Now I'm telling you, he did not run up and say, how great, how great is my God. It wasn't a matter of that. He ran up and lowered himself to the submission of the one that he knew that had the power to destroy him. Do you guys get what I'm saying? You're saying, man, this is not what I was thinking that it was going to be. I think that's the problem with church as a whole is it's not what we think that it should be. We've got the wrong mindset of worship. We have the wrong attitude going into it from the very beginning. See, he bowed down in respect to the one that was the king. They stood in the presence of the creator, but he acknowledged that he was standing in the presence of the creator. And they submitted to his authority. Let me read the definition again. So that we can get our third definition. Worship means to kiss like a dog, licking the master's hand, to frown or crouch, or to, to bow oneself in homage, to adore, to reverence. See, here's the third thing. Worship, true worship, is the act of adoring by an expression of love. Now I'm going to show you the order of which we've discovered this as we've gone through Scripture to do this. Number one, it's an attitude of recognizing him as the King of kings and the Lord of lords, as the Redeemer and Savior. Number two, it's a matter of bowing oneself in respect to the one that is there. To lift up one's hands and surrender or to bow oneself in respect. To acknowledge who he is and place yourself under the authority and humility and submission and surrender, however you want to put it. But it's also an expression of love. Literally meaning that when I am before the king, I must do something. When they're in heaven, the only thing that they could do is they sang the new song. But the other thing is they cast what they had in their hands of possession and say, I must give it to you because you deserve what I have. See, the thing is, when there is true worship involved and the other things fall in place, you can't help but let it out. But it's got to start in the heart. It's got to start with conviction. It's got to start there. See, in Revelation, when they viewed Jesus as their Savior, the expression of love followed. When they viewed him as the Redeemer, the song came. The love came. The sacrifice came. They praised him. Now, this will all come to light as we explain this. But I, I ask you the second question. And most of this is going to be next week, but I just want to lay this out. Do you truly worship? I I, I don't know any other way to bring this into application. And maybe I should have used the words, do we truly worship? Not just do you, do we truly worship God? In Luke chapter 7, and all of that's just laying the groundwork, but Luke chapter 7, if you look with me in that passage, we have an example of true worship. Not from our perspective and not from man's perspective even in the passage. See, this passage describes worship, but the word worship is not even mentioned in the passage. But I'll tell you what is mentioned in the passage is the fact that Jesus said that in this situation that he was loved. It's one of the only passages in the entire Bible where Jesus says, they loved me. They expressed their love, their attitude from the very beginning was worship. But this setting is not like any other setting that we would ever think. Because when we think of a worship setting, we think of this. We have a stage. We have people. We have people leading. We have all these things. But that's not what we find in this passage. Let's paint the picture. The Pharisees, the religious man, the respected man, invites Jesus into his home. Luke chapter 7, verse 36. And one of the Pharisees desired him that he would eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's home. And he sat down to meet. And behold, a woman of the city, which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment. And he stood at his feet behind him, weeping, and began to wash his feet with tears 
and did wipe them with the hairs of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with anointment. Now, when the Pharisee which had bidden him saw it, he spake within himself, saying, This man, listen to this, this man, if he were a prophet, no acknowledging meant whatsoever of him being the King of kings or Jesus Christ or the Savior, Redeemer, whatsoever, and the attitude was totally different between them. If this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what manner of man this is that toucheth him, for she is a sinner. Is there any sinners here today? Man, there's a lot of sinners here today. Thank God. Well, you're, you're among friends, so you're in the right place. We're all sinners saved by grace. Praise God. But there's a religious man that thinks he was there to impress Jesus. And then there was a sinner that thought she had nothing to offer, but God comes back and says, that's a woman that truly loves me. So do you truly worship? Question number one, do you view him as worthy? And this is the only question before we get into the others, but I want this to sink in before we come into this next week. Now, a lot of us would say, yes, yes, I do. I believe that God is worthy of my praise. I believe that he is worthy of my attention. But remember, all of this starts in the heart. It's a mindset of how you view God. Now, I'm not going to get off here, but I, I, hang with me. I'm just out of curiosity. Saturday was a big game. How many of you watched the big game, okay? All right, that's probably, probably at least half of you guys. I'm not even going to mention it. That's not the, the point of this whatsoever. I like to watch football. I do. I, I enjoy it. I'll be honest, I'm not obsessed with football. I'm not one of those that I, I've got to go, you know, I'm not going to be crushed if I can't be there to see a game. I'm not going to be crushed. But yesterday was a little different. I wanted to be there. I really did. So I worked out my schedule and got everything done. I went home at 12. I sat on my couch. I got chips. I got salsa. I got, I got, I got, I got something to drink. And I sat there on my cushion couch, reclined on my couch in my house, had my TV on and the temperature set to the way that I wanted, and I sat there and enjoyed the game. Now, there's some people that go to the game and praise God for the opportunity to do that, but you sit on that bench and you pay, who, God only knows how much for that board. And then there's people that would go so far and say, I would not miss a game for nothing. Have any of you guys seen the picture like this? of these guys going to this football game and you sit there and say, I'm not leaving this game. You say, why would you do it? It's worth it. It's my team. You know why people would do that? Because they're crazy. That's why. I I was almost tempted to quit the game yesterday just because I ran out of nachos, okay? I just, I was thinking, it's just not worth it anymore, okay? I, I have limits, you know what I'm saying? I mean, I'm, I'm not pushing myself. I'm not giving myself to this. So a, co- a few years ago, I had this idea, and Jenny's parents and, and us had this thing that we would do, that once a year we would meet her parents somewhere, and we would exchange one of the kids or a couple of the kids, and they would go stay with Grandma, and we'd have the house without the, the angels in the house. But anyways, it was, it was vacation for both of us. It was a wonderful time. And I remember the one time I figured out, the time that we were going on that day, there was a Tennessee Titan game playing against the Green Bay Packers in a preseason game. Now, you guys all know that preseason games are nothing like the real deal. It's just warm up. They don't put in the good players and and everything else. So we were all excited about that. So this first, that's Jenny at the game. So it's it's empty. We're at Tennessee Titans. We all got decked out. We were all excited about that. I loved it. I was in the zone. I I thought this is going to be a wonderful day. My heart was in it. I'm telling you guys, my heart was in it until this next picture. I don't know if you can see that, but I literally took my camera up and it began to rain. It began to pour. And I was documenting our, our, our thing saying, you know, I was trying to, you know, tell Jenny, hey, it's time to go. And she's like, it's first quarter. I don't care. It's raining. I'm getting wet. So we got ponchos. So here's, here's picture. And this is how Jordan was having the best time ever. He was like, dad, why are we doing this? This is dumb. Why are we here? Let's get out of here. So we left. Not all of us. So that's the, the crowd began to dissipate. And the one in the yellow, that's Logan and, uh, and Jordan right there. And then Jenny's parents, Jenny and Morgan up there. Eventually, we bailed out of the game. We got nachos in a spot there was no rain. We found a seat. and We sat there and watched it on a TV on the wall. That's what I did. 
I went back out there like, like an hour later trying to find these people, thinking they just washed away. There they are, all by themselves, Jenny, her mom, and her dad. Oh my God, we got out, we're walking out of there literally squishing in our tennis shoes and walking all the way back. And I said, why in the world did you stay out there? Why in the world did you do that? And literally all of them at the same time said, because we love our Packers. Their mind was already messed, uh, made up of the affection of their heart of what they were going to do with their time, their attention, and their focus. You say, how did that happen? They have a long history of the Green Bay Packers. This is, this is Jenny. I, I don't know how old she was. This is Jenny as a little girl. She wasn't wearing the Packers thing, but her family was all hardcore Packers back then. Got their, their, their toddler pictures with a football. What kind of little girl gets her picture with a football? <laughs> Doesn't make sense. She was indoctrinated. She grew up. When I met Jenny in college, I went up and she had all her, her folders and everything. Her folders were all Green Bay Packers. There was another guy she was carrying around with her when I met. His name was Brett Favre, a picture of Brett Favre. <laughs> you don't know who that was, a famous quarterback for the Green Bay Packers. And I literally went up to her and said, who is that dude? And she almost like quit dating me over that question right there. Like, you are not worthy of me, dude. <laughs> I say, what is the point of this? You see, it's amazing what's going to come out of our lives when we fall into God and we understand who we're serving. But the reason that a lot of us don't take the time and we don't get up and we don't make the effort and we don't pursue him because it has not gone to our heads, to our hearts. You see, in that situation, the Pharisee went in. He didn't wash his feet. He didn't bow down before him. He didn't greet him. He didn't do anything like that. He viewed him as a religious man and an obligation. But that woman, when she walked in here, viewed him, viewed him as her future, as this Savior, as the one that could forgive her and set her free. And the response of that is she bowed down before him and poured everything on him because she loved her Savior. You see, this isn't a matter of what we do. It's a matter of who we love. It's not a matter of the actions that happen in the pew or on the stage. It all begins with the attitude. When Jesus intercepted the woman at the well, he went up to her and said this. And sometimes we miss this. He was looking for worshipers. And she began to debate, do we worship on this mountain or on that mountain? And Jesus said, no, I am a spirit. And they that worship me must worship me in spirit and in truth. That is big spirit of God being a spirit. But when he talked about us, it was lowercase s, literally meaning the attitude of man. Everything that we're talking about is our mindset, our view of God, our heart, our love, our passion, our conviction, what we do. Let me put it like this. We talk about without surrender, there can be no worship. With a bad attitude, there can be no worship. If your mindset is not in love with the one you're worshiping, then your words mean nothing. It's like Valentine's Day, and you go get your wife a Hallmark card and just put it in the envelope and give it to her. It is empty. Jesus was confronting the Pharisees. When he confronted them, he was talking about their worship. He says, they worship me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. And he said, they do it all in vain. You know what the word vain means? It is empty. It means nothing. It literally means that your heart is not in it and you don't care. See, what's it going to take to have that worship that we pour our heart and our love and our attention back on God? Let me tell you, church, it begins with repentance. It begins on our knees. It begins with understanding that he is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. It begins with the mindset of understanding that he is everything and I am nothing. When we walk into a worship service, we walk into the attention of it being solely on him and not on us. That girl didn't care who was looking or who was mocking or who was laughing. She says, I have an audience of one, and his name is Jesus. Amen. I want us to understand worship, but it begins with this attitude. It begins with the mindset. It begins in the heart.